Hi everybody, uh, today's the last day of Pity, and you know, as part of the sort of process of unwinding out of Pity, I thought it'd be fun to do some interviews with friends of the Armory, um, of which Simon Crompton is of course a very, very important one. Um, I'm sure you guys already know who Simon is, but Simon, for the, for the viewers who've been living under a rock for the last 20 years, please tell us what you do. Uh, so I run a website called permanentstyle.com, which has been going for 15 years and started off as a very personal blog back when blogs were like the trendy thing to do about bespoke tailoring, bespoke shoes, high-end crafted menswear like that and has grown over time to be a bigger platform with their own events and written various books over the years and done products and so on. 15 years man, congratulations. That Thank you man. That is wild. 15 years. Much. 15 years. And you're I mean, you're still as prolific as ever, actually. You still write a lot. And you never yeah. really got guest writers, did you? You always write everything yourself. There's been a few more recently, but yeah, generally there wasn't. Yeah. Like with the, the very first few weeks, I think it was a, the thing with the blog, which is maybe like a diary, so you'd one every day. Mm -hmm. I think for the first like few days, I did one every day and then quickly realized that wasn't going to work. Then I switched to three a week, and it's been three a week pretty much ever since. Wow. But, uh, can, you, can you give us like a little a potted history, like the evolution of it over the last 15 years? Sure. Okay. So. I guess one important thing is that it's been my full-time job for the last six years, I think. Mm -hmm. So my career was as a financial journalist <laughs> and a legal journalist, and I'd started the blog in my spare time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just something I was really interested in. I was kind of coming to pity, even though I wasn't in the industry, and like interviewing brands mm -hmm. and like writing content. and A little bit of that sartorial tourist thing that yeah. we'll talk about in a bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and. Yeah, and it kind of it got a bit of a following. We got some recognition on like GQ and like New York Times and stuff, which kind of built up a bit of a following, which was really nice. Um, and then eventually it got big enough with enough income that I could quit my job because I've got three kids and a mortgage and everything else. So yeah. it needed to be big enough to be able to quit my job and do it full time. But one of the things the I think I was very fortunate that I could have that time to build it up because I think it's very hard for guys these days to try to build like a platform and you're trying to monetize it very quickly because you need to kind of make some money. You can't do it for whatever it was, eight, nine years yeah. of not making you know, enough money really to kind of support yourself. Of course. Um, so it's very hard, I think, to build up that kind of following that Permanent Style had. I mean, just for, from like a business hat sort of perspective, um, so there, are, there were originally some collaborative products yeah. and there still are, um, but actually you also did a lot of pop-up shops, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pop-up so, shops are very cool, and oh, you're still doing them to today. Yeah, 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 so that started about five years ago. Okay. Um, we were kind of approached by the landlord who owns one side of Savile Row, mm -hmm. and like, it's the, the not-so-good side, where none of the famous tailors are. And that side of the street used to be full of quite cheap, like, made-to-measure tailors who were just trading off the Savile Row name. Mm. And the landlord said, okay, we want to get rid of all these guys, we're going to chuck them out, and we want to get, like, heritage menswear brands in there a kind of compliment to the tailors on the other side. Um, and so they offered us one of the first empty space and we did a pop-up shop and we brought in lots of brands that we knew and really liked that for whatever reason you couldn't get in London physically, either because they were online stores mm -hmm. or because they were um, abroad and you know, foreign, you couldn't access them. Mm -hmm. So we brought in all these kind of small brands and then the, the idea with the landlord was he wanted that they wanted to see them give them a chance to kind of try out the space and then hopefully they'd take a full-time uh, shop uh, you know, when they realized it would kind of work for them. And a lot of brands in this space are too small, but actually a lot of the brands that are now in that area like had their start yeah. in the pop-up shop. I mean, the pop-up program um, was kind of the precursor to modern Savile Row now too, because mm. I was actually asked to kind of like give some opinions and, and give a little help to the landlord regarding tenant mix and that sort of thing. Mm. And, and one of the big problems of Savile Row was that it was all the best, but also all the most expensive tailors in England, which, yeah. you know, it's not like, that's not a place where you comparison shop, that's not a place where you like want to stop into every door. Yeah. You know? Whereas now, like, there's a mix of high-low, there's a broad range of categories, like, it's, mm. it's a lot more interesting now, and I think the row is much better off for it. And I'm sure, actually, the tailors appreciate it as well, just because they have a much greater yeah. variety of, of clientele than they ever did. So They tend know, to be quite grumpy about anything that changes on the street. Yeah, they won't, they wouldn't true. like it to start that's with, no matter true. what it is, but that's yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, uh, so there's the pop-up, and then the books. Because mm. you've written quite a few books as well. Yes. Uh, so the first one was did was a little tiny kind of tailoring uh, like pocket guide mm -hmm. um, with Hardy Grant that we did one called the finest men's in the world mm -hmm. with Thames and Hudson. 
did another couple like with Thames and Hudson and Prestel. And then the last few years, we've also started doing our own books ourselves that we publish. So like we did one called The Style Guide um, and one called Bespoke Style, which was all the kind of bespoke suits and jackets I've had made from lots of famous tailors and all kind of analyzed and picked apart in a, the kind of geeky detail that a lot of the kind of the readers like. Um, and that's been quite nice. It's quite freeing. Like it's nice having you have the followers and the platform to kind of publish what you want. Go, mm -hmm. what, what, whatever I want to do, we can publish it, we can sell it, and it's not going to lose money, and we can kind of you know, yeah. do what we want from that point of view, which is nice. That's great. What mm. do you think's next? So we're actually, uh, Jamie and I are working on a sequel to The Style Guide, okay. which will hopefully be out later this year, mm. uh, called The Casual Style Guide, mm. which again is like an interesting theme, like reflecting the site and also maybe like the world as a whole becoming gradually more casual. Yeah. So it's a sequel, the same format as the front first guide, except that it's, there's no tailoring, it's all just casual clothing, from pretty smart casual clothing to, very ca to, to much more kind of workwear and that kind of thing, more, much more rugged stuff. Mm. Um, Jamie's shots, all, but the difference this time is you've got commentary on every image from both Jamie and me, mm. which is actually, I wasn't sure how it was gonna work, but it's really nice because Jamie's opinions are much more fun and jokey, uh, kind of reverent, mm -hmm. whereas I tend to be a bit more kind of geeky and analytical and kind of picking stuff apart. Mm. So That's super interesting. I look forward to that. When's that coming out? Uh, so we're not sure yet. It'll be in the autumn sometime. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I mean, we'll do some launch events and stuff as well. It'll be yeah, nice yeah, to yeah. do something together. Yeah, it'll be nice to do something at the Armoury. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's talk about Pity. Because, mm. God, you've been coming to, I have, I've been coming to Pity now for 14 years, I think. Wow. And about the same for you too, right? A year, not that long, but maybe at least ten years. Though. At least yeah, ten or eleven years. Yeah. Yeah. I try, I was trying to remember this morning which year it was, and I, I could look it up on the site, but I can't remember. But yeah, I'm being so nervous. I was coming for the first time. Me too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but what, when were you? You were coming for the first time like, as a buyer. So the first time as a buyer, right before the show started. So I was coming in order to like pick out what are we going to, like, what are we going to stock in the shop? And so you knew particular brands you wanted or just like a general category of I want to find someone who'll do that like this? No, we didn't really know. Huh. We had a few in mind and okay. we had like made an appointment to go see them. But we were also just like checking things out hmm. and see what's happening, you know? And actually, especially like those early days of, well, not early days, but the early days of me being involved with Drake's, like the Drake stand was like a big deal, a pity. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We wrote a lot of orders, there was always a lot of activity. And uh, well, here we are 13 years later. It's mm. a very different pity, right? Yeah, and I, I, was, I was thinking about this. I knew we were gonna talk about how pity has developed, which I think is a really interesting topic. But actually you, I mean, I have one perspective. You have a perspective much more as a buyer yeah. and also been on the other side of things and how yeah. that's kind of changed. Because yeah. I think from the outside, I'm aware of like, if brands are there or not there to cover and aware more of like what the general communication and media kind of around is like, but not so much actually being on a stand or being a buyer most of the time and going yeah. around places. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what do you think of the style of pity? So I think uh, like pity became popular, at least in my view with people like Scott Schumann and stuff like shooting a lot of those uh, menswear buyers and people from uh, Italy, but also internationally, you had classic style, but made it look really, really good or do it in different ways and characterful ways. And that was amazing. Yeah. Then as it got bigger and bigger, you got more and more people coming along to be shot and trying to get attention yeah. and wearing very loud clothing and clothing that wasn't as good yeah. or not, from my point of view anyway, not as tasteful and, and not as good. Um, so that kind of grew. And I think in the last few years, certainly since COVID, we've seen that kind of come down, there's far more, less of that kind of peacocking kind of activity going on. I think you, you still see us a guy on the street just now wearing like basically dressed like the banker from Monopoly, but like all in like straw and you're going like, for God's sake. But this, you know, that still <laughs> happens, but I feel like there's less of it, maybe in, like, hand in hand with the coverage as well. Like I think pity isn't as big a thing. Not every magazine is doing like sh looks from pity. Yeah. You know, a lot of them do it, but not as many. And so if you haven't got as many photographers, not as many people come to be shot, and then like kind of, all kind of whittles down from there. Well, it's funny, like, Scott Schumann was probably the first. Mm. And there was people like Ross Bangle, Tommy Ton, mm. um, then after that was like Milad, you know, like I can sort of identify certain generations. Yeah. Um, this time here, it's, I, haven't, I don't see most of those guys, probably because they've all moved on to like other projects, mm. but it's kind of cool to see Scott still here. 
Yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah. Scott is yeah, still, still shooting. Yeah, like, interesting. He's still, I don't know, he's maybe because everyone's gone, he's like even more invested in like <laughs> staying here and yeah, maybe. to see what's Can outlast up. everybody. Yeah, but yeah. you know, Scott originally was giving the world like this little peek at the fashion world that isn't normally quite so on display. Like yeah, the inner work exactly. Of like the trade fashion, side of it. The trade side of it, exactly, right. Mm. And then as the other photographers started to come in, people started to dress more for the camera. Mm. Yeah, But exactly. then as the camera men have dropped away, people realize, oh, we just make this stuff ourselves. And so everyone's just shooting themselves now, too. That's true. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, it's Which become quite like, like self-referential, yeah, almost. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's such as the state of the world. I <sighs> yeah, I guess it used to be that if somebody was photographed, then it was almost like would be interesting because they're photographed. And I guess, uh, particularly some of the early ones like Tommy Ton and, and Scott, over time that became less the case because it's more like a circus and you have people that document the circus almost. Yes, yes. So now, if people are photographing themselves, but obviously there's no guarantee at all that, you know, that what they're doing is worth looking at. But people are so used to filtering images themselves now anyway, yeah. right, on social media and stuff that yeah. they're kind of filtering those people out anyway. Yeah, that's true. I say I, I did I still do really appreciate like the talent of good photographers to pick out like interesting looks you mm. know and do the filtering for you because sometimes it's not so much about like the things you want to see and versus you don't want to see but being like fed something that might not be typically to your taste but mm. is, is worth you considering as well I yeah definitely interesting. yeah and we were considering doing we didn't have time in the, eventually with this pity but we're considering doing a series of like little articles where you get different photographers to pick out the outfits they like, mm. and then you see actually how the selections are slightly different depending on what that person's taste is like. You oh know. yeah, for yeah. sure. Like I don't think there's as much overlap between the photographers. I, anyway, listen, I'm, I'm really going down memory lane now because <laughs> things are so different. Do you think Pity got more casual? Yeah, definitely. I, mean, I think the world has got more casual and people are wearing more casual clothing here and the brands are kind of reflecting that as well. But also I think Pity was always more casual than people thought it was. You know it was always the tailoring that kind of got known and people photographed the most, but there was always like casual brands going on that aspect to it, yeah. you know? I thought it was funny, like last, uh, last Pity, I was wearing like jeans and a jacket of someone. And then people said the comment, oh, can you wear like jeans to Pity? It's like, everyone's wearing jeans. It's like workwear brands everywhere. Yeah. But you don't necessarily see that if all you're seeing is those certain types of, yeah. you know, certain types of brands and that's what's being photographed. I mean, I haven't been Pity now in three years and it was, it was a little jarring. To oh, really? see the changes, because you know, like, there always used to be that that older generation of like fashion entrepreneur or fashion professional at Pity was always suit and tie or mm. this jacket and tie, you know, and those guys are mostly gone now. Yeah, that's a good point actually, because all the attention gets taken by the younger people and what they're wearing. But you're right, it's that older generation actually was really yeah. interesting. Yeah, and then I guess because the composition of businesses that are at Pitsy now is different from before too. Yeah. Like it used to be more like traditional old guard type brands and mm. now it's moved on to like younger brands and uh, newer brands and obviously like the look is much more streetwear, it's much more casual. Um, so I don't know, I, I guess it's a lot of different factors all coming in together at the same time, right? Yeah, I think the one I noticed the most is that I think there are fewer, fewer manufacturers now or every manufacturer is now also a brand mm -hmm. like in the 15 years of permanent style i think almost every manufacturer that we have covered has become their own brand at some point yeah and that might have been because of economic pressures or whatever else but also it just became much easier to do that direct consumer model mm -hmm. you know to have e-commerce and to have like uh do, do the logistics and everything just seemed was so much easier yeah that every brand started doing it and then things got mixed up and yeah. now a lot of the time you go around pity you, don't, you have no idea whether someone's a manufacturer or not, right? Yeah. They're all brands, yeah. and some of them are manufacturers, but you don't know because they're all just brands. Yeah. You know, and, and I have that kind of look to them as well. I mean, one of the surreal things for me about going to Pity, and actually this has, has uh, this applies from like, since I first started, it was sometimes it's hard to tell what's a factory and what's a brand. Because mm. sometimes when you're talking about these like, these, these brands, like they might be big in a certain territory. Mm. They're just not big in any of the territories you exist in. Mm. So you just have no idea. Like, mm. are these guys new? Are they old? Are they a factory? Are they a brand? Like it's, but you know, the world's a huge place. There's a lot of people out there who buy clothes. And so you can't yeah. know every single brand. No, absolutely not. But it's a hard thing as a journalist, it's hard, but also as a buyer, it must be hard. Cause like you see somebody new and you basically, the first question you want to ask is, are oh, you a manufacturer? Do you make your own stuff? You know, and like, and, and, and what's the quality like or something, and, but you can't, you have to have a little chit chat first and look at some products or whatever. Yeah. 
and it's only after a while you find out that actually yeah. they don't make anything, you know. And they're just reboxing the same place you already use. Like what you were mentioning about direct-to-consumer, because that's changed a lot. Mm. Like direct-to-consumer has, has become a bigger thing, A, because it's easier to run online platforms, it's mm. easier to run online websites, easier to do logistics. Um, but also just like I think a lot of brands and a lot of factories, you know, they used to have to provide finan financing terms to their clients. Mm. And especially during a period like COVID, yeah. where like the income's super uncertain, yeah. like it was just not worth, like it was not worth making that, uh, making that financial sacrifice anymore. You yeah, know? I never you know? thought about that, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's really something you would only, s yeah, again, that's really interesting seeing it from your point of view, more from the business side, I guess, yeah. for a lot of these kind of people, which I wouldn't really appreciate. Yeah, anyway, mm. um, Clothing-wise, aesthetic-wise, anything that you really liked seeing this time? I think it's usually like the really high-end makers that always kind of save it for me. Someone yes. like Coherence, for example. Yeah. You go around Coherence in the stand and you're like, after walking through basically like a sea of fairly mid-range like Italian shirts and Italian like linen shorts or whatever, all looking pretty much the same in the same kind of colors. Yeah. And you go to Coherence and like every single piece you pick up is just so beautifully made. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and because it's not widely stocked or widely available, you won't have seen most of those things yeah. before. And may, maybe you'll never see them being stocked, but they're yeah. just so beautifully executed. Yeah. Like I was there, we were there yesterday, trying on this amazing like packable travel jacket and this incredible material. And like you're a big materials person and you know you like love that about, yeah. about what they do. Yeah. And then and like and the tailoring and the whole kind of like the, the sub brand, the Lubium is, uh, yeah. It's amazing. And I think every time if you're bored of pity or it's like it's too hot or there's like too many people in like orange trousers and <laughs> you just want and you just for God's sake and you've had like five coffees and you're out too late the <laughs> night before and you go somewhere like coherence and you're just like, Oh thank God. Yeah. Menswear is good. I wanna I wanna save this. Like I just wanna buy stuff for you just so you can carry on going. We were out with them it's last beautiful. night. Beautiful. Yeah? But we 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 finished at nine thirty PM. Oh okay, that's fine. <laughs> Very civilized. <laughs> And then, like, anyone else, like, um, like I saw Sarah fan today, like the French leather maker, yeah. and it's the same thing. You walk and it's like, this is just beautiful. Yeah. And even though some of the Sarah fan stuff is not my taste, it's a bit more kind of like modern and like the, it's all the yellow metal zippers and it's a bit more kind it's of biker. Yeah, very it's luxe, very luxe, exactly. It's beautiful. Yeah. Like and a real, like, it feels like real luxe. Yeah, it's not exactly. Not luxe. You know, actually, have you ever heard of this phrase? It's hilarious. It's um, premium mediocre. Is that the phrase, Elliot? Was, do you remember I was telling you about this? Like was it premium mediocre? Yeah. So what's, it means something which is kind of mid-market, but they're trying to make it look better? Premium or? mediocre is like the best bottle of wine at the Olive Garden. Uh, right? It's something okay. that's like, it's like very, it looks great on Instagram, but it's actually not that special. Uh, okay. Premium mediocre. Yeah, 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 okay. So yeah. You, yeah, you've gone and asked for the best thing that they have, that's actually not that good. Yeah, yeah. I gotta dig that up for you. I'll, I'll link it in the YouTube description. It was a it was a hilarious article, and it <laughs> kind of hit the nail on the head of just like, you know, in this current social media driven world, like what's good, what's bad, what's like finely made, and what's just mm. pretending to be finely yeah. made. Yeah, you know? and there's so much more hype now as well, particularly with TikTok and those kind of videos. Everything is like you must get this, guys. You must get that. Oh yeah. yeah. And there's no context, yeah. not necessarily even an experience from the person that's tried lots of different things. It's like this thing is good. It worked for me. Therefore, everyone must buy it. And they're like, yeah. uh, I need more than that. You yeah. know. No, absolutely. Well, I mean, that's the good thing about permanent seller is like you, you really spend the time to like research things and just, and having broad experience, like I think permanent style will always be better than last year, simply because you've seen more stuff and as you, huh. as you see more stuff, your judgment improves and, and you can place context a lot better. That's cool. nice. Yeah. I like that, that's very optimistic. It's like, yeah. it's easy to feel after 15 years that like you couldn't like get better or kind of do things in a better way. So that's, yeah. thank you, that's really I nice. Mean, look, the chances of you finding something that's like mind blowing is now obviously way lower because yeah. your standards are way higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not necessarily a bad thing. No, it's true. Yeah. It's actually it's one of the nice things about covering a bit more of the casual clothing mm -hmm. is it does give me excuse to kind of cover different things. Yeah. So suddenly covering more about like actually what makes good denim, for example, or yeah. like where well, we're in Japan, Okay. Okay. Sorry. Well, I mean, we're in Italy. They're yeah. grinding coffee, I assume. <laughs> so. Okay. Bye. We couldn't spring for a studio. All right. Sorry, man. I know I'm not worth it. It's all right. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know if you ever have you ever been to like a loop wheel like knitting factory. 
I have, yeah. So like, I, I just love the fact that it's like, yeah. it's like a 180 pound or something sweater, yeah. but it's made the same as like the cashmere stuff we're covering in Scotland, which is like you know, three times the price or whatever. Yeah. And it, was, it was really, really nice. And then you pre again, you appreciate that product in a kind of different way, yeah. you know? It's really Absolutely. nice. Absolutely. <laughs> um, all right, man. Well, congratulations on 15 years. Thank you. Thanks for sharing some thoughts about Pity. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Anything mm -hmm. else you want to mention before we close out? No, I'm good. Okay, then good. last Thank thing, because this is tradition. Um, what are you wearing today? Ah, okay. Uh, so today I'm wearing a vintage rayon jacket, I think from the late 50s, which I bought in Japan. Um, a knitted cream t-shirt from the anthology, thanks Buzz. Uh, some black linen trousers made by Whitcomb and Shaftesbury and Baudin Lange Sagans, which despite basically being crashed into cobbles for three days, aren't looking too bad. Yeah, oh, and for watch guys, nice. reverse, so. Nice. Oh yeah, and you just did that article with um, GLC, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that thing, that was great. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah, it was thank really you very cool much. just to, you broke it down well. Really? You know? Yeah, I really like it's, that. Because it's, again, like, it's a nice thing doing something different on the blog, but it always makes you nervous. Like doing the denim thing, you're just like, you're waiting for those denim heads to like, you've misspelled that, you didn't mean that. So doing watches, it was quite scary for me as well, because like I want to get it right, and I, and I feel I have very little confidence in doing something which is someone else hasn't already written. So it's really nice getting your perspective on that. Well, I mean, it, it, it was just classic, like Simon's curiosity being focused on something that you know, it's not something that he normally talks about, mm. but it's more like the tone and, and the depth of the curiosity that, that is familiar to me. Uh, and okay. so I was like, okay, that's nice. I get it. I like, I like reading this I'm, because mm. Simon wrote it and I'm interested. Okay, that's yeah. really nice. That's amazing. Oh, man. All right, cool. Good to see you. Thanks, you too. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.